Great, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Sung. I'd like to thank the editorial office for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm Zachary Brown from uh, The Ohio State University. I'm going to be talking about adjuvant treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma. I have nothing to disclose. So a little outline of my talk today, I'm going to go over some background information about recurrence and then go into previous attempted therapies for adjuvant therapies for HCC, including systemic, local, regional, and immune therapies. And then gonna talk a little bit about pathways to how we can improve success to try and get approved therapy in the adjuvant setting. So currently in the United States, the FDA has no approved therapies in the adjuvant setting for HCCs, despite numerous um, attempts to try and find a, a therapy. And this is an issue because recurrence rates after resection for HCC remain high where they're up to 70% at five years after resection. And these, re these recurrences can either be considered an early recurrence or a late recurrence. Early recurrence is defined as happening within two years of resection, while well as late recurrence is after two years. And there's different risk factors that go into this. Early recurrence is thought to be a manifestation of intrahepatic metastasis where tumor characteristics, such as a large tumor, incomplete tumor capsule or venous or microvascular invasion are thought to be risk factors for early recurrence where late recurrence is thought to be more likely related to de novo tumor development and related to the extent of the patient's underlying liver disease, as well as a high alpha fetoprotein or AFP level. And for systemic therapies for almost the past decade until recently, serafinib has been the standard of care where as a result of the SHARP trial in 2008, Serafinib showed a 2.8 month survival advantage over placebo. And again, has been the standard of care for nearly a decade. And in 2015, Serafinib was tried as an adjuvant therapy and the results of the STORM trial, which was published in 2015, which showed no difference in recurrence-free survival with only a 33.3 month uh, survival in serapinib compared to 33.7 months in placebo. So it did not reach its primary endpoint of showing a decrease in recurrence-free survival. There's been multiple other studies looking at systemic therapies, namely chemotherapies in patients with HCC. Again, serapinib was tried and failed. Cepcitabine, which is now the standard adjuvant therapy for biliary tract cancers, did not, um, improve overall survival, although it showed some benefit in disease-free survival, and UFT showed no difference in recurrence-free or overall survival in these patients. Also K2, uh, or vitamin K2 has been tried in multiple studies, which showed heterogeneous effects with mostly no difference in recurrent in disease-free or overall survival. And the thought behind K2 was that it inhibited the expression of a hepatoma-derived growth factor, which is highly expressed in HCC cells and cause stimulating cell proliferation of oncogene and angiogenic activities. However, showed no benefit in these patients. Other studies have been tried. You can have heparinase inhibitors, which showed mixed results using different dosages, might have improved recurrence-free survival at one year. And vitamin A derivative shows that it might have prevented recurrence. However, this study has been highly criticized as in most patients in this study had vitamin A deficiency to begin with. So we don't really know what the effect is of the vitamin A derivative in patients that have adequate vitamin A levels. Moving off of systemic therapies, multiple local regional therapies have been tried in the adjuvant setting as well. And this is to take advantage of the dual blood supply of the liver with the hepatic artery and the portal vein and that the hepatic artery is mostly supply to tumors in the liver. And the local regional therapies are standard of care for patients with intermediate stage or Barcelona stage B HCC. And this is a list of, of more recent studies looking at adjuvant taste in patients uh, with HCC who have undergone uh, resection. And you can see it's a very heterogeneous group of drugs and, and just heterogeneous effects of this as well, with some showing some improvement in recurrence for your overall survival, while others showed no improvement in recurrence for your overall survival. And none of these have been approved as a standard for adjuvant therapy. In addition, intraarterial iodine-131 has been tried as a, a, a lipidiol, as it has shown uptake and prolonged retention in hepatoma cells. However, this has failed to show any benefit. And also hepatic artery infusion therapy has been tried where you place a pump or a catheter into the gastroduodenal artery, try and get uh, direct uh, 
flow to liver, the chemotherapy agent, and again, uh, mixed results, but overall, no, doesn't seem to prove any benefit in recurrence free disease for your overall survival. And then antiviral therapy has been tried multiple times where chronic viral hepatitis is the, it's the greatest risk factor for development of HCC. And the antiviral therapy was thought to help prevent uh, late recurrence by basically improving liver function later on in the disease state. And several trials have shown that lamivudine have no effect on post-operative disease for your overall survival. And other studies show lamivudine or other nucleoside analogs to improve tumor disease survival in patients with high serum hepatitis B DNA and prolonged post-op survival by improving liver function. So it's hard to tell if the survival is due to an anti-tumor effect or just improving liver function overall. And then immunotherapy for HCC, this has really taken off in the last couple of years. And some of the reasons why immune-based approaches seems to be appropriate for these patients is the liver is naturally immune tolerant due to the large influx of antigen it gets from the GI tract. And HCC is considered an inflammation-induced cancer, bruises by either viral hepatitis, fatty liver disease, alcoholic liver disease. And again, that liver disease on top of it leads the, the liver to be even more immunosuppressive. So the thought of using an, uh, an immune modulator is to get more tumor immunity versus tumor growth. And one of the first therapies that have been done in the immune realm has been interferon. Is it, this thought it would be great because it shows some antiviral and anti-tumor function. Where you can see from this list that it's largely been ineffective in these patients in the adjuvant setting with no improvement in recurrence-free disease for overall survival. And next, cell-based therapies have been tried with adoptive cell transfer, which is highly personalized where you grow or, or harvest immune cells off the tumor itself and then give it back to patients. You can see here that it has been shown to recruit to reduce some recurrence-free or increase recurrence-free or overall survival. However, the results have been mixed. One interesting study with, cytok or it was with cytokine-induced killer cells or CIK cells, which have potent anti-tumor activity and they act like a T cell and an NK cell. And how they do this is you harvest the peripheral blood mononuclear cells from patients and basically grow it in a cytokine um, cocktail with an anti-CD3 antibody. And it gets these cells to kind of become a hybrid. And with infusing these in post-operative patients, it showed a decrease in recurrence-free survival, overall survival, as well as disease-specific survival in these patients. However, the um, widespread availability of performing this therapy is in question. Also, vaccine therapies have been tried with some limited success. And the one main thing that people are looking forward to is the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, serafinib was the previous standard of care, which has been changed to a TZO-BEV recently as the results of the I Am Brave 150 study in which head-to-head uh, -head with serafinib, a TZO-BEV showed a improved overall survival at 12 months as well as progression-free survival. And this is in the advanced setting. So multiple studies are currently undergoing looking at immune checkpoint inhibitors in the adjuvant study, and we're awaiting the results of these studies, including the I Am Brave 050 study, looking at TZO-BEV, Checkmate 9DX, looking at the use of nivolumab, and the Emerald 2 study, looking at adjuvant nivolumab with or without BEV. And then the question is, how can we improve our success rate with these patients? And as we know, there's different risk factors for recurrence. They can be clinical factors, molecular factors, or immune factors. And can we better select patients who would benefit from an immune uh, or a uh, adjuvant setting uh, therapy? Where if we have patients with large tumor size, extensive liver disease, high F AFP, would they be appropriate more for an upfront setting while patients who are at lower risk for recurrence would be more uh, ready for a watch and wait approach in these patients? And then if we look at immune factors, there's emerging immunoscore assay, which looks at um, burden of T cells within and around the tumor, and looking to see if, how that affects our recurrence rates and if we're able to more highly predict which patients are at risk for early recurrence. And then as to which patients and which therapies we should get, we have some insight into which uh, patients might respond better to an immune-based therapy and that might be more appropriate for them. So this is patients with high tumor infiltrating lymphocytes within the tumor, patients with intact interferon gamma signaling, presence of immune checkpoints, high mutational burden, or high expression of CD4 
PD-1 positive cells in the PBMCs prior to starting therapy. So taken together, can we actually more accurately predict which patients will respond and which patients are at the highest risk for early recurrence, which might be um, amenable to more adjuvant therapy versus a watch and wait approach with more uh, um, patients at risk for later recurrence. And this is what a flow diagram might look like where we can actually even have a neoadjuvant approach in the future looking at um, effector function of our therapy, inducing tumor shrinkage, and then going off of surgery or RFA and getting molecular or pathological characteristics on these patients to better select our patients and better select our therapies moving forward in the adjuvant setting. Uh, thank you everyone for your attention and thanks again for the opportunity to speak today.